This week on The Communicators, two perspectives on recently announced proposals by FCC Chairman Julius Janikowski that would affect information that travels over the Internet. Chris Gutman McCabe is with the Wireless Association, and Ben Scott is with the public advocacy group Free Press. Well, this week, the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, Julius Jenikowski, made an announcement regarding network neutrality policy. That's our topic this week on The Communicators. Here's a little bit of the chairman. I propose that the FCC adopt the existing principles as commission rules, along with two additional principles that reflect the evolution of the Internet and that are essential to ensuring its continued openness. The fifth principle is one of non-discrimination stating that broadband providers cannot discriminate against particular internet content or applications. This means they cannot block or degrade lawful traffic over their networks or pick winners by favoring some content or applications over others in the connection to subscribers' homes. Nor can they disfavor an internet service just because it competes with a similar service offered by that broadband provider. The internet must continue to allow users to decide what content and what applications succeed. This principle will not prevent broadband providers from reasonably managing their networks. During periods of network congestion, for example, it may be appropriate for providers to ensure that very heavy users do not crowd out everyone else. And this principle will not constrain efforts to ensure a safe, secure, and spam-free internet experience or to enforce the law. It is vital that illegal, contact, uh, that illegal conduct be curtailed on the internet. As I said in my Senate confirmation hearing, open internet principles apply only to lawful content services and applications, not to activities like unlawful distribution of copyrighted works, which has serious economic consequences. The enforcement of copyright and other laws and the obligations of network openness can and must coexist. I will propose that the FCC evaluate alleged violations of the non-discrimination principle as they arise on a case-by-case -case basis, recognizing that the internet is an extraordinarily complex and dynamic system this approach within the framework I am proposing today will allow the Commission to make reasoned, fact-based determinations based on the Internet before it, not based on the Internet of years past or guesses about how the Internet will evolve. The sixth principle is a transparency principle, stating that providers of Internet access must be transparent about their network management practices. Why does the FCC need to adopt this principle? The Internet evolved through open standards. It was conceived as a tool whose user manual would be, would be free and available to all. But new network management practices and technologies challenge this original understanding. Today, broadband providers have the technical ability to change how the Internet works for millions of users, with profound consequences for those users and content application and service providers around the world. And Chris Gutman McCabe is the vice president of CTIA, which represents the wireless industry. Mr. Gutman McCabe, what's your reaction to the chairman's statement? Well, thank you, Peter, and thank you for having me on the program. Um, I think our concern, I guess, would be that memorializing a set of rules at this time could have a, a significant impact in our space on both investment and innovation. And I think a, a, a good illustration of that is if you were just to look back 18 months ago, and, and look at the wireless space just simply 18 months ago. The hottest handset in America was the Razor. Uh, there was no such thing as an application store. There were no 4G networks, and arguably some of the 3G networks were still being built out. Um, the Amazon Kindle didn't exist. The, uh, the iPhone was just being launched. So in this 18-month period, you've seen an explosion of innovation. You've seen Google launch two different phones. Palm come out with the Pre. BlackBerry has launched four phones. You've seen uh, the iTunes store launch an applications uh, section, and all of a sudden we've gone from zero to 100,000 applications available on wireless devices. In an 18-month period, you've seen um, sort of a, our whole ecosystem has changed. Where it was once carrier-focused, we now have carriers, we have handset manufacturers, we have infrastructure vendors, we have um, operating system providers, and then we also have now these application stores. So memorializing a set of rules now in such a fast-moving uh, space I think is cause for concern and, and I think we would have um, concerns again depending upon how they are memorialized or if they are memorialized how they would impact innovation and investment in, in our space. And how would a policy of network neutrality impact investment and innovation? Well I, c I can give you one example and it's actually a, a hard and fa uh, uh, fast uh, illustration of investment. The 700 megahertz auction just ended about a year ago 
Um, there were four licenses, five that were put up for auction, four that were actually successfully auctioned. Two of them sort of give a good example of this. The C block license, which was 22 megahertz in, uh, in size and basically was able to be aggregated into a nationwide license, sold to, uh, to one company, basically had two bidders, although most argue it had one bidder, uh, sold for four, a little bit over four billion. The B block, which was right next to it, which was half the size and sold in over 700 pieces, sold for more than nine billion. So the C block, which had net neutrality, it had an openness principle attached to it, was twice as big and sold for about half as much. And that, to me, gives you an illustration, at least in the spectrum context, of the uncertainty, the, the, the risk that, that is entailed with someone who has to move uh, our services into that type of environment. And joining in the question is Cheryl Bolin of BNA. She's a telecommunications reporter. Thanks for having me. Um, Mr. McCabe, uh, you, you said you before you, that you're concerned about unintended consequences of net neutrality regulation. Sure. But specifically, what, what's the worst that could happen? Well, I, again, I sort of I, I look at where we are now and where we could be, and I and I compare the U.S. wireless industry to just about any other wireless industry on the planet. So, in our space, um, we have the the hottest handsets are all launched in the United States first. We have the largest number of subscribers on the highest speed wireless networks on the planet. We have the least concentrated wireless network on the planet. So we have the most number of providers, um, whether, it's, whether you look city to city or the nation as a whole. We have the lowest price per minute. We have the highest minutes of use. We have the most aggressive consumers in terms of broadband usage. So I look at that equation and I think, what is going wrong and what could go wrong? And, and I would argue that while the industry obviously is not perfect, there not only has been an evolution in the technology space, but in the last 18 months, we've seen you know, the carriers offer 30-day trial periods. We've seen them offer um, pro-rate early termination fees. We've seen them now allow consumers to change elements of their contract without extending their contract. And so, to me, the concern is there's, there's nothing going wrong, arguably, in this space, and there's a, a heck of a lot that's going right right now. And when you look at, you know, how do rules, a set of rules such as those proposed, if they were memorialized 18 months ago, think of what they would have missed. Think of how stark the change is in the last 18 months. And I would argue that we're going to see that type of change in the next 18 months. So you say net neutrality regulations then would, would have stopped a lot of this or would stop this innovation going forward? I don't think we know that for sure. And, I, and, and you know, I'm, I'm happy to say when I've listened to the chairman and I've listened to some of his staff, you know, A, it's a brilliant group of people and they understand it. They understand the differentiation between wireless and some of the other platforms. We have a job to explain to them that this is evolving so quickly and a number of the issues that have been the focus, whether it's of the press or of policymakers recently, interestingly, a number of them have not been carrier specific. So Google to Apple, Palm to Apple, uh, Google to, I saw something today where Google sent a cease and desist letter to a developer also. So we're seeing within our space a real evolution and that doesn't even bring into play um, you know, um, applications or devices like the Amazon Kindle or netbooks. And so, from our perspective, really, there's, there has to be a lot of sort of a treading lightly, hopefully, on behalf of the commission or other policymakers. Chris Gutman McCabe, what about the broadband rollout and investment in broadband? Do you think it could affect that also? Well, um, I, I sort of wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't explain, I guess, how much investment has occurred to date. So if you look at the last three years, and I, th I don't think anyone would argue that, that they have been the easiest three years from an economic perspective, but our industry in the last three years has, has put $100 billion into the economy just from an infrastructure and in capital expenditure investment perspective. That doesn't include salaries or benefits. You, you, you add those into the equation, you're talking about, about $140 billion. I challenge it, someone to find another industry that has done that much. And then simultaneously, and, I, and we look at this sort of as, as a virtuous cycle, you need the networks to be upgraded so that you can have the smarter handsets, so that you can have the new applications. Then consumers buy the new handsets with the new applications and push the carriers to invest. So in 10 years, we've gone from analog networks to digital to later second generation to third generation, and now we're on the cusp, Clearwire's leading the way, Verizon, of fourth generation networks. And we're talking 
tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars over the next couple of years. And I think that we should be, we collectively should be facilitating that. And, and, and I know that that is the goal. I know that's the chairman's goal. I want to make sure that what happens when these um, uh, policies are debated, there is an understanding that, that there is a risk at, at, at putting some of that investment uh, at, at harm. Were you surprised by this announcement? Um, I, you know, I'm, I would probably say no, not surprised. I think obviously concerned would be a word that would come to mind. Um, surprised that it came while we're debating a number of other issues in the wireless space like innovation and competition. Um, but again, for us, we look at it as an opportunity to educate policymakers, the chairman, other commissioners, um, people in, on Capitol Hill and in, and in the states. So to, to us, it's an opportunity, just like the NOIs were an opportunity. One of the concerns of the FCC is to apply the regulations evenly across all broadband providers. Why do you think the wireless industry, but maybe not wireline or cable, should be exempted? Well, I'll give you an example of why we're different and, um, and maybe it sort of feeds into your question. Um, number one is on our devices, so if I were to take out my wireless device, um, th that device provides both voice and data service, at times simultaneously, but at least on the same elements of the platform. So a heavy data user in our space impacts our voice calls. And so that would be part one. Part two is our, our service is mobile in nature. And so our carriers are constantly trying to, trying to recognize and identify and respond to peaks in demand that are mobile in nature. So it's not just traffic in and out of the city, it's also do people converge on a site for a meeting. Um, and so when you look at that mobile mobility uh, element of it, it is clearly different than what cable faces or what the landline providers face. And then from our perspective, um, we can't build out of this problem. Uh, we are limited by the amount of spectrum that the government assigns and sells sells by auction to us. So, you know, when you look at sort of those three, um, it does, it makes us different. And I, and I do have to say, I know the Commission knows that and they understand that. So our job is to explain and, and maybe put some hard facts to that. Um, uh, uh, one that I would throw out for the listeners is a YouTube download on a mobile device uses 100 times the bandwidth of a voice call. And so that's something that we're going to have to, as an industry, uh, learn to and deal with managing that type of, of traffic, broadband traffic. And that, that does make us different. But, but the uh, wireless industry already has different price points, does it not? Whereas uh, if you have a, a wired connection broadband at home, you pay a, one price a month. Sure. You've already got a price point where if you use this much time, you pay that much, this much time, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. And, and, um, and Peter, you, you raise a good point. I, I, I chuckle a little bit because we get beaten up at times for having too many offerings, and then we get beaten up on the other side of the equation because people say we're too concentrated. Um, we do. We have a range of offerings, and if you look at that, when I talk about sort of innovation, too often we slip into talking about technology. And as I mentioned earlier, we've seen a lot in the consumer space. Think of 10 years ago how high our bills were. They were close to $100. They were pay for every minute that you used. And, and in that 10 years, we've gone to uh, uh, calling plans, buckets, nights and weekends, family plans, my faves, in-network, um, rollover minutes, prepaid, postpaid, all of the above. We, we saw that concept, at least, now evolve to text messaging. And we're seeing those prices change and come down and evolve. And now we're seeing it in data. And, um, a, a great example is um, Cricket just entered the DC market and they have a 5 gig uh, cap on their broadband service. They just offered a 10 gig, which is different than, than what some of the other carriers are. So we're seeing an, an, an evolution even in, in, the, in the data space, in the broadband space. Commissioner McDowell has said that spectral efficiency doubles every two and a half years. Mm -hmm. So aren't really these capacity limitations temporary? I wish that were the case, and and as a lawyer uh, by trade, although I've I've tried to to put that aside, um, I don't think that's the case. And 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 my the reason is, and you can look at this whether you look at it in the wireless space or in um, sort of the the wired space or your your typical computer and usage. For every additional through some efficiency, every, every additional benefit that is gained, someone intelligent out in America is finding a way to use it. 
And so when we actually have submitted a paper to the FCC that talks about broadband demand, and the paper talks about sort of an, an impending perfect storm of broadband usage between consumer uptake of wireless broadband, better devices, better consumer experience, more optimization of websites and, and things like that, explosion of applications. You look at all of that, every efficiency that's driven out of, of the third to fourth generation I believe will be captured very quickly by the innovation of the handset makers and the applications providers. And that's why we've pushed very strongly for the federal government to focus on getting more spectrum into the market. Go ahead. <laughs> Do you think there might be, though, a, maybe a consumer backlash if they were able to go home and get services and applications on their PC, but then find they couldn't get them on their wireless device? Well, you know, I would argue, A, that they're different. Um, the, the, your wired device is not mobile. You can't pick up your Fios connection and even walk down the hall. Maybe, well, maybe you can if you've then attached it to a Wi-Fi, but you can't walk outside your home. Um, so they're different, but I would also argue that if consumers want something, this industry has a track record of providing it. So you look at the fact, even in D.C., we just, just learned this the other day. In D.C., in the, in the district, there are six facilities-based providers of wireless service. There are nine MVNOs, so, so you can get wireless service from 15 companies in D.C. That, I've been doing this for, for quite some time. I found that amazing. I asked our folks in our stats department to, to track the other nine largest cities, and then I asked them to track the 10 smallest, and was stunned to find that in, in the largest cities, not one has less than 15 providers, and not one has less than six facilities-based providers. So we looked at the small ones to see how big the, di the discrepancy was, Eight of the ten smallest cities have five facilities-based providers. So, and the other two have three. And their numbers don't go up to 15, but they, they have a number of MVNOs, sort of um, resellers, in essence, providing there. So you're going to get someone, if it's, a consumer, if, it's a, if it's a product that consumers want, someone in our space is going to provide it, whether it's uh, one of the four largest or whether it's one of the other companies that come in and like a, like a cricket or a metro that provides just a real disruptive force to the market. And finally, Chris Gutman McCabe, um, on your policy agenda, where do you rank this issue of net neutrality, net management, and what kind of reception do you think uh, Chairman Janikowski will get in October at your annual convention? Um, uh, I would argue that this is numbers one, two, and perhaps three, um, at least in terms of our need to educate the commission. I actually think the chairman will get a fantastic reception because, uh, you know, we are happy to, to see um, the chairman talking about having a fact base, a fact-driven FCC. He's talked about it in the NOI proceedings that have been launched, but he's also talked about it in the NPRM. Um, he's a sharp guy. This is a, an industry that, that wants to innovate and evolve and, ev and invest, and I, that's what he wants. So I think he'll get a great reception. Um, I certainly hope he will, and I really do think he will, uh, both from you know, our board members, but also from, from the audience at, at, the, at the show. Chris Gutman McCabe is the vice president of CTIA, which represents a wireless industry. Next, we're going to talk with Ben Scott of the Free Press Organization. Ben Scott, what did Julius Janikowski's announcement mean for you? It means that consumers are about to get what candidate Obama pr promised uh, during the election, uh, a free and open Internet guaranteed by law, executed by the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, Julius Janikowski. It's a big moment. It's the end of a years-long debate over what the future of the Internet looks like. and. From my perspective, it's a great moment as a consumer advocate because consumers are going to win out if uh, the chairman is successful in achieving what he uh, set out in his speech. How do consumers win in your view? Well, no secret uh, to anybody who's ever gone online, the Internet is a magical free market for speech and commerce. It is the greatest engine of innovation since the printing press. And we want to keep it that way. We want that market to be open. We want the playing field to be level. We want choices to be made by consumers and not the network operators who sell them service. Network neutrality simply codifies those principles into the law and says if we go over those lines, we're going to correct and we're going to move back to that model. And it's worked for us brilliantly for years, and we're going to carry on with it. Um, ben Scott, you heard uh, Chris uh, Gutman-McCabe of the CTIA say that he is worried that if 
such a policy were enacted um, that investment in telecommunications, particularly wireless, would fall dramatically. I have uh, certainly heard these arguments many times, not just from Chris uh, and my friends at CTIA, but across the industry. This is a common refrain. Anytime industry is faced with a regulation they don't like, they say, oh, this is going to hurt investment. We'll never be able to deliver products and services. And then as soon as they lose the fight and the regulation is in put in place, they say, well, that wasn't so bad. And they move on to the next thing, and then we play it all over again. And because Washington is in a town uh, with chronic amnesia, no one remembers the last time around, and we don't, uh, we don't uh, exercise the skepticism that we ought to. The truth is that the relationship between regulation and investment is not cause and effect. Regulation, the, the relationship that triggers more investment is competition. And so regulation only depresses or increases investment insofar as it increases or decreases competition. For me, net neutrality is the ultimate pro-competition policy. There's no reason to believe that this is going to send negative signals to Wall Street. Now, you've also heard that Verizon and other carriers say that the instances of blocking, the, the real specific examples of blocking, are extremely rare. There's really not a problem here. Are net neutrality rules really needed at this time? The common refrain, solution in search of a problem, Ben. What, why do you want these network neutrality rules? To me, uh, that's, it's missing the forest for the trees. It is true that there have been a small number of instances in which carriers have violated net neutrality up to this point. That's a good thing. And they've only violated it on a couple of occasions because regulators and consumers are breathing down their necks about what the future of the Internet ought to look like. However, at the same time as they're arguing it's a solution in search of a problem, we would never do that. On the other hand, they're saying, we have to do that in order to get the investment we need in order to build out our networks. So you can't have it both ways. Either you would never do it and it doesn't matter, or you have to do it in order to get a return on investment. As soon as we set aside the rhetoric and get down to the business of actually looking at the policy, I think those kinds of arguments are, are going to continue to distract from the real issue. And, and another argument that uh, Mr. Gutman McCabe made was that um, that the reason that these rules are being put forward now, at least one of the reasons Chairman Janikowski said, was that there's limited competition in the industry, but yet the wireless industry is very competitive. Should wireless be exempted from these rules? In no way should wireless be exempted from these rules. We have, throughout telecommunications history, had a problem with policies that were designed for particular technologies. Today, we have a policy and a, and a legal framework around cable television. We have a policy framework around wireless. We have a policy framework around telephone networks. This is all being sort of uh, disrupted by the Internet because the Internet offers all these services. So how do we handle that? Well, we certainly don't want to repeat the mistake of the past, which is to take one of them and, and, and take it off to the side. That sort of exceptionalism just creates problems. And, and it really denies what we're seeing every day in the marketplace, which is that consumers are getting access to the Internet over their wireless devices just in the same way as they're getting access over their computers. Increasingly, there, there's no such thing as the wireless Internet or the wired Internet. There's just the Internet. And we can't have policies that are designed to foster an open market of competition with speech and commerce on the Internet if we've exempted wireless from that picture, when wireless is, is a very common uh, means for people getting access uh, to the Internet. So it just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And also, would it be fair now to apply net neutrality regulations to those carriers who just spent billions on 700 megahertz spectrum, knowing that these type of regulations wouldn't apply to them? Well, I mean, they've got a good talking point there. Uh, they don't have a lot of legal uh, argument to, to there. They are, let's be clear, they didn't buy a deed to the public spectrum, they bought a license. And the public controls that license. Those are our airwaves that they're using to transmit their signals. And the Federal Communications Commission, representing the public and consumers, has every right to go and say, we've decided that the license conditions need to change because this is in the public interest. We hadn't clarified that before. We're clarifying it now. Similarly, uh, imagine we were talking about uh, a public safety issue, for example, a, a worker safety rule or something of that nature. If there was a company that had bought access to uh, federal lands to build a building or to drill an oil well and we changed the safety regulations, you know, they 
they bought that license not knowing there was going to be a change in the safety regulations, but we need to have better safety. No one's arguing over the outcome there, and they're going to apply that to that license. It's the same, it's the same outcome here. So I really don't think that that's going to uh, hold water in the end. Is it fair to compare public safety, though, with a commercial enterprise? Well, it, the example uh, I think is apt because increasingly uh, the Internet is no longer a commercial service. It's an infrastructure. And I, I say that, and, and it sounds somewhat quixotic because we think about it as a commercial service. I'm buying myself some Internet access. But if you look at what the government did with the Recovery Act, 700 plus billion dollars of spending into public goods, you see that not only did they put $7 billion directly into grants for broadband infrastructure, they layered on top of that tens of billions of dollars in programs in smart grid, health IT, technology and education. All of those programs assume a robust broadband infrastructure that is reasonably comparable in quality and reasonably comparable in price across the whole country. That's infrastructure policy. What we're witnessing at the FCC now is the logical next step which is we're going to create a regulatory framework for the Internet, which recognizes that it's an infrastructure now and not just a commercial service. Ben Scott, what other kind of regulatory framework do you foresee for the Internet? Well, I think that it will be a, a very light overarching frame which says we want to make sure that the market is open, we want to make sure that it's competitive, we want to make sure that consumers are in control of their Internet experience to the greatest extent possible. Uh, we want to make sure it's affordable. We want to make sure it's delivered to every household in the country and not just those in urban areas or those in high income neighborhoods. So I think that the regulatory framework, and there will be one, this, there's a myth that, oh, we're going to have a deregulated market or a regulated market. When you're talking about infrastructure, it's going to be regulated one way or the other. We're just talking about what kind of regulation we're going to have and whose uh, interests they're designed to serve. And so I think the baseline principles are going to be openness, competition, deployment, uh, capacity, and affordability. And I think that's something that a, a vast majority of the public can get behind. We heard from the wireless industry that uh, this net neutrality proposal that uh, Chairman Janikowski made is priorities number one, two, and three for their industry. <laughs> well, I'm glad to see they're paying attention, and I hope that they will engage in a serious way to try to resolve this issue uh, in a productive way so that the industry can move forward with good public policy behind it. Uh, I think that you're witnessing something that uh, people are taking their positions, they're posturing, they're, they're playing politics. We're at the beginning of a process where everyone knows we're going to end with some kind of a rule preventing uh, network operators from discriminating on the Internet. And they're trying to position themselves to maximize their leverage in the ultimate negotiation. So I think you're going to see those kinds of hyperbolic statements a lot over the course of the coming weeks. Can I ask about the, the Commission's authority here? Now, for some time, they've, uh, the Commission has argued, really in the context of the Comcast case, that they, they already have the authority to, to prevent these kind of behaviors. So why is it important to have rules? So I think what Chairman Janikowski is doing is he is proceeding on a path that it's a logical extension of things the Commission have done for years. If you look back uh, at this whole debate over the last several years, you see not only did the Commission uh, intervene when Comcast was blocking a popular Internet application, they also uh, have, you've seen the Commerce Department apply and open this condition on the broadband uh, uh, infrastructure grants out of the Stimulus Act. Uh, you've seen the Commission pursue policies of openness in wireless spectrum. What he's doing is he's institutionalizing this principle in a way that it hasn't been in the past. Right now what we have in the law are, is a policy statement. The policy statement is guidelines for the industry uh, that is enforceable uh, on, on the underlying statute, the Communications Act. What he's saying is we're going to clarify that and we're going to put rules on the books so that this policy is institutionalized going forward and there is certainty in the marketplace as to what is expected, uh, what is inbounds and what is out of bounds. Uh, already rumblings in Congress about introducing legislation to counteract any proposal or any policy that the FCC comes down with? So uh, as, as I read the news cycle, uh, there was an immediate reaction in the Senate uh, after the speech by the chairman on Monday. And several legislators, Republican senators, uh, introduced what's called a limitation amendment to an appropriations bill, simply saying, 
anything the FCC is about to do, we're not going to give them any money to do it. <laughs> to me, this is just another stunt, another piece of hyperbole to try to create a political environment in which positions are, are entrenched and negotiations can, can proceed from there. Uh, I think it's, it's a bit uh, too much to say, we're going to prevent you from doing thing you haven't even done yet, but just announce that you were going to start a process to do. Uh, come on now, we gotta, we've got to let people do their jobs. Ben Scott, do you s foresee court case or court cases? Virtually every major decision that the Federal Communications ma makes, Federal Communications Commission makes, is taken to court by someone. Uh, so it seems uh, very likely that it, if they pass a rule in the spring, uh, someone will take it to court. I think that the quality of the process, the history behind this issue, and the deliberative um, fact-based evaluation of the commission before they vote on it will be the judge of whether it holds up. Uh, I'm confident that this is not something that's going to be thrown out by the courts. But in 2005, as you know, the, the commission declared broadband service to be a largely deregulated information service. Doesn't that sort of undermine the commission's authority to come back and regulate now? So uh, under the Communications Act, when a service is moved into that category of information service, they have they, they, re they retain authority. In numerous cases, uh, services that are regulated under information services have, uh, have seen regulations applied, new rules, laws that govern the industries. Uh, the courts have upheld that on more than half a dozen occasions. I think that uh, what's called ancillary jurisdiction in the, in the lawyer's lexicon uh, will once again hold up in court and we'll see the commission affirmed in its ability to protect consumers on the internet. Final question, Cheryl Ball. <laughs> um, so you, you, I heard you say you thought that final rules would be adopted in the spring. Uh, how do you see the, the process playing out? Do you see a lot of public input on this, workshops as, as the chairman has had before? Absolutely, and that'll be part of my job as a, as a consumer advocate to educate the public about what's happening in the government and why it matters to them show them the, mat, the, the way they can participate. I think to the great credit of this FCC, they have opened numerous apertures for public participation, including a new website, openinternet.gov, open, uh, to solicit public opinion. Groups like mine, freepress.net, have opportunities for people to learn about the issues and send comment into the commission. I would imagine they'll do workshops and solicit uh, opinions from across uh, of a wide variety of stakeholders, and that is as it should be. And Ben Scott, tell us a little bit about the Free Press organization. Free Press is a nonprofit public interest organization. We are the eyes and ears of consumers in Washington. Uh, we don't take a nickel from any corporation or from the federal government. We're entirely supported by our members and charitable foundations. And we're trying to make sure people know what's happening and can get involved in the decisions that shape their media and their internet. Ben Scott with Free Press Policy Director, Cheryl Bolin, BNA. This has been the Communicators Program. You can watch all the past Communicators programs on our website at cspan.org.